So all of these things came about. Salah ad only statement to the Christians that were there because the Catholics had brought bells with them. He said these are to be rung at no time because he quoted a hadith in which the bells are from the handiwork of shaitan in Sahih al-Jami'ah. So he said these are to be rang at no time. And so they could gather themselves. He said once you're inside, but not outside. You would have to use some other means of calling yourselves together. Do not do this outside. So a lot of what occurred, Salah ad even the people that had killed close members of his family, he did not retaliate. He did not retaliate. Rewind back, 100,000 dead in one day, some of them eaten. Salah ad takes back over, nobody eaten. People give him freedom, all these other things. And that's why even among the unbelievers of these people, Saladin, as they call him, they respect him because he represents everything that is chivalry and fair play. Fair play is not dropping a nuclear bomb on a city and when they surrender nine days later dropping another one. That's not fair play. Fair play and righteousness is not killing millions of people over 20 years and saying we had to do something they wouldn't resist Saddam. That's not fair play. So Salah al-Din al-Ayubi represented all of these things. Now, Najmuddin al-Shirazi, he was one of the 40 Abdal. He died in 586 AH and was buried at Qasiyun Mount where the Abdal meet every year. I've mentioned this in one of the previous statements that I said. Every year, the Abdal meet near Jabal Qasiyun. Or Qasiyun is this, it's two different pronunciations they have for him. Imam Najmuddin al-Shirazi was one of those abdal. So he dies and gets buried at Jabal Qasiyun. Now his rank was such in which whenever something was difficult for Imams Muwafiq al-Din and his brother Abu Umar, they used to ask Najmuddin who would always supply them with the answer. So whenever they came to this badal and asked him any question, he had the answer. Because these people, as we mentioned in the hadith, these 40 high-ranking saints, they're the ulama of the ulama. They're the cream of the ulama. And as the hadith we have in the Muslim and Sahih al-Jamia, that sustenance is sent down to you in rain because of them. These people. So when you come to them, it's these abdal, as I mentioned before, it's these people that meet together, that give fatwas, that reverberate for the whole ummah. Regarding uh, crop ro rotation or uh, issues that have to do with uh, genetic modification of food or test tube babies. When they give fatwa on these matters, it goes through a whole range. Now, Imam Muwafiq al-Din is no minor figure. He's a memorizer of 400,000 ahadith. He's one of the abdal. But it shows within the abdal there are ranks. And the greatest of them have ranks within them. So it must be understood that these people, when you look at them, these abdal, they're the scholars of the scholars of the scholars, the cream of the ummah. And nowadays, some people will conflate between the scholars and sometimes have them all in one lump. The scholars are not of lumps. They, they have different patterns and ranks within them. And so when you're looking at the pattern of a fatwa that you should take regarding an international issue, you don't speak to your locally. You don't ask your local imam, how do you feel about this imam sahab? He's nothing. You deal with and you look for what are the abdal saying about this matter? I don't care what the local imam says. If he's barely able to speak pidgin Arabic, alhamdulillah, we're fortunate. Never mind asking him about something that's beyond the scope of his limited grasp. Allahu Akbar, he barely comes outside. So we have to look at things in their proper perspective. That the abdal, these are the people. So every now and then, they'll just come out and say something and disappear again. Or they'll come out and say something and no one, to this day, among the Palestinians, the bedal that distributes the food among them is Imam Abdul Rahim al-Hanbali. He distributes the zakah among them. 
He collects everything together, just him, and somehow him and whoever people help him, they distribute the zakah to the people in terms of food, in terms of drink, and what have you. Every now and then a statement will come out, like for example, I'll give, I've, I've stated it before, when Shaykh al-Azhar came and he said that the niqab's got nothing to do with Islam, and then he also made a statement before then regarding hijab in France, both times they went to one of the abdal, and one of the abdal of this age is Shaykh Muhammad, Muhammad Sa'id Ramadan al-Buti. And he said, you tell, you tell Sayyid. He didn't even call him Shaykh. You tell him that I say he's wrong. That I say that that's not correct. That's the bedal. They, they, you're on a first name basis with them, but it's the other way for you. So he says, you tell him, because who is Shaykh al-Azhar compared to the abdal? Even, even in its heyday, what was it? Now what is it? Well, it's a minister within the government. Sheikh al-Azhar is the Ministry of Islamic Information. Who is he compared to the Abdal? Sheikh Wahbaz Zuhaili. You have Sheikh, Abdul, uh, uh, you have Sheikh Ismail ibn Badran. He came to Kuwait. There's people, uh, there's men, grown men fainting when they're seeing him. People kissing his hands and feet. This, these are the Abdal, these are these people. The people of rank, the people of shukr, the people of fadl, the people of sharraf, the people of karam. It's these people. So when they come to some place, you know, people are getting out of the way and all these other things are happening. And so when you look at these people, it's like when I asked uh, Sheikh Muhammad Fawad al-Burazi, I asked him about the different ulama there. And he said, yes, the, the ulama still remain. And then he said to me, he said, I left 20 years ago when that Taghut, referring to Hafiz al-Asad, who was the ruler at the time before he died, he said, that Taghut, he says, I was there during his time, he says, but then I left. And the people of Denmark, having him there, if they're not utilizing him, I feel sorry for them on the Day of Judgment. Because the man that's come all that way, I feel sorry for them. So some of you, if you've had the opportunity to meet those people, you know, don't waste their time. Even if you can just shut up and just sit and just listen to them speak, do that. Because these high-ranking people have an authority in the ummah that's not like anyone else that you'll meet. They're not. And so this is why the abdal are so important. One of the greatest war generals the world has ever seen, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, founder of the Ayyubid governments, governance, Ash'ari theologian, thinker, and the most famous Kurdish ruler of history, died in 589 AH. He was carried on the backs of scholars and nobles alike. After his death, the organized system that he had set up dissolved as his brothers fought. Once the Franks saw this weakness, they began making incursions into the Muslim world yet again. The Franks took Beirut from the Muslims in 593 AH, and this battle continued throughout the year. Tuhtikin, brother of Salah ad-Din, also died at this time after much service to Islam. We come to the year 595 AH. Fakhruddin al-Razi had a huge incident in Herat in Afghanistan when he met Majduddin ibn al-Qudwa and debate resulted regarding it. Now, some people need to understand Fakhruddin al-Razi is perhaps one of the greatest Shafi'i, Ash'ari theologians that ever lived. He wrote a book which is a tafsir of the Qur'an, which some printings, it's 19 volumes, some it's 21. It depends on the size of the print and what printing house. He is one of the greatest Ash'ari theologians that has ever lived. He is a towering figure. And his tafsir, some scholars advise students of knowledge not to read it alone. Because the depth of what's there, the language, the prowess, all the other things inside of it. He, again, was one of the ulama that tried to join between and reconcile Neoplatonist philosophical speculative theology and the Muslim creed. And this caused huge 
disagreements and misunderstandings between him and other ulama. Because you had some ulama that rejected the use of Neoplatonism and, and using uh, Greek reasoning and Greek logic to come to con conclusions and believe that it was incapable of being reconciled with the religion. And so in Herat in Afghanistan, he fell out with Majduddin ibn al-Qudwa and some of the other ulama. And it became so serious that Fakhruddin al-Razi, in the course of the discussion, uh, cursed uh, Majduddin ibn al-Qudwa. And Majduddin retaliated and said, and you as well. And so the other ulama had to interfere because they said that Fakhruddin al-Razi, his durus, and the things that he was saying in Afghanistan was causing the people to argue too much. And so the leader at that time in Afghanistan, the governor, asked Fakhruddin al-Razi to leave. Because the dispute, the way that the governor was seeing things is, how were things before Ilm al-Kalam came? Well, they were calm. Is Ilm al-Kalam something that the populace need? Or is it something that is the providence of scholars of high rank? Well, something that providence of, that's the providence of scholars of high rank. Well, then if that's the case, then we don't want it spoken about here. Because you must remember, Afghanistan was still being consolidated by the Hanafi scholars. Because originally it was Shafi'i. The Afghanistan was Shafi'i. So now it was coming into its own under Hanafi governance. And the Hanafis, we must remember, are Maturidis. And so they don't want to hear anything about philosophy, Aristotle. Like for, so for example, sometimes in Fakhruddin al-Razi's lectures, Aristotle's name would come up. And so you have these Maturidis looking and say, what, what's he doing being mentioned? Why is Socrates being mentioned? So they, you know, they stormed the minbar. And some of the arguments were so rough at one point, the people put on the minbar that Fakhruddin al-Razi was going to speak from, some people put some insults against Fakhruddin al-Razi and his family. And he stood on the minbar and he said, you have referred to my wife as an unrighteous and loose and immoral woman and my children as illegitimate. He says, I say to you in truth, that would be better for me because if my wife is loose and an immoral woman, she can repent. And if my children are illegitimate, that is no fault of their own but mine. I bear that responsibility. But if your creed is incorrect, that is something where you can be punished for all eternity. And I make no mistakes and I make no apologies for my creed. And so this continued, this dispute. Back in Sham, there was a massive discussion between Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi, in which some of the Ash'aris actually plotted to kill him. And so he had to leave the city to go to Egypt. This is the same Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi who memorized 700,000 hadith. Why was this, there's this dispute? Here's why. The Mu'tazila originally were using the theological statement, Lovely bil Qur'ani makhluq. My recitation of the Qur'an is created. My recitation of the Qur'an is created. Because they believe the Qur'an was created. The Qur'an was created at a point in time. It has a human element to it. It's not, the, uh, it's not the complete speech of Allah. It's the speech of Allah and the fact that it's an expression of his speech. But it's a human, it's, it has a human endeavor to it. Muslim Orthodoxy said, no. It is the infallible, irrefutable, indomitable speech of Allah. It is the knowledge of Allah. It is the speech of Allah. And they quoted verse after verse, hadith after hadith. So when they said lovely bil Qur'ani makhluq, Imam Ahmed knew that they meant that they're saying the Qur'an is created. After Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari repented from the Mu'tazila, came into the faith, he used the expression, same expression, but what he meant by it, lovely bil Qur'ani makhluq, what he meant by it is that his, the instrumentation of his larynx and the moving of his lips and his tongue, that was created. But that which came out of it wasn't. That was the Qur'an. Hanbali scholars said, we're not going to allow this to even be discussed. Because they just defeated the Mu'tazina. So they said, we're not even going to allow it to be discussed. But Fakhruddin al-Razi, he reintroduced the discussion. 
which created heat, massive heat. 